the title of this talk could be titled, um, Does a Patient Really Matter? These are my disclosures. When you go to a patient and say, I'm going to give you an injection to settle this down, they'll say, well, where do you give it? And I say, well, it's in the eye. I said, oh, you've got to be real. You know, are you really going to give me an injection in the eye? So um, can you hear me? Uh, so how does a doctor see it? A doctor sees this as he's coming in, and he says, well, I've got 17 injections this morning. So there is a disconnect between how a patient might see injections and how we as treating specialists do. This study was alluded to this morning by Paul Mitchell. It was published last year, a German prospective study, which shows and highlights that the majority of patients need assistance. So we sometimes forget that the patients are connected socially and with carers, and that two-thirds of the patients entering for treatment require assistance. One in 10 were afraid of injections. And the most um, surprising point is at the bottom. Eight out of 10 patients are aware that they would go blind if they didn't have treatment, but only two of the 10 were aware that this is a chronic disorder that requires long-term treatment. So we're clearly not getting the message to our patients that this is a chronic disease. Does visual impairment have a significant effect on quality of life? Yes, it does. And if you look at where macular degeneration sits, both the early and late forms, it really does cause very significant changes in quality of life, rivaling cancer, strokes, cardiac disease. The impact of vision loss on the individual is not just that they lose visual acuity, that they can't see as many letters on the chart, but in the real world, it impacts on psychological well-being, their ability to remain independent, their ability to work, particularly in the context of uh, patients who are diabetic. I have patients who come and see me, and they don't tell me a lot of this, but eventually when they do ask them, they express a really deep concern that they may lose their independence. They might ask things like, uh, am I going to go blind? What they're really saying is, am I able to remain independent? Do I start to need to look for assisted living? They may say to me that, look, my wife's been very unwell. I'm the only spouse, I'm only the, the only partner that's able to drive and look after an invalid spouse. So they have these concerns. We assume patients are always compliant, but they are not. And these are the broad compliance drivers that influence ultimately our ability to carry out care. In the case of macular degeneration and intravitreal injections, it's physical burden, financial burden, and importantly, patient expectations. In my practice, I find that at the beginning of treatment, patients are really happy with the response to the initial and maybe first few injections. They get a great benefit, and then they think that they can stop. And later on, we're talking second, third year, uh, and if the vision fails because of coincident uh, dry macular degeneration, they lose enthusiasm and want to stop again. Both of these situations can be addressed with appropriate education and support. We've heard that the real world clinical practice is not like what the pivotal trials have told us. That macular degeneration is a chronic disease, it's non-curative and goes beyond one or two years as in clinical trials, but into their, as Neil said, 13 years of experience and treatment. We know now that vision can be maintained for five years and longer. The FRB data shows that. Um, our group has also looked at that. And so it is a marathon rather than a short sprint in managing this disorder. There are two concepts that I want to take you through now. And the first is adherence. And that is the extent to which a patient follows instructions for a prescribed treatment. And we as doctors control this the timing, the dosing, 
the frequency. The other concept is persistence, and that is a measure of treatment continuity. And that is how long a patient continues on treatment before discontinuation. And patients control that. This is uh, data from um, uh, the drug utilization uh, data from Medicare. And you can see here that with time, there is a decrease in the number of uh, treatments given. If a patient stops treatment, and I use this data with my patients almost every day, if we stop treatment, is that a problem? Yes, it is. This is an Australian study from Mark Giddes' uh, clinic. And it shows here that 91% of eyes developed reactivation when they ceased or discontinued treatment, and that this translated to a fall in vision. And this, reinf and this reinforces I might just run off the and this reinforces the need for ongoing uh, review and treatment. Is compliance an issue? Is it something that faces us around the world? And the answer is yes, it does. In a Swedish study, 21% of patients discontinued before a year. In a French study, 40% of patients did not even receive the initial three monthly loading. Back in 2012, there was talk about compliance. And in Servio, which does a lot of support for our patients, was uh, proposing that patients did not continue on treatment and said that up to a fifth of patients did not complete treatment at one year. I thought that didn't happen in my practice, and I said, no, I challenge you. I, I reckon you know, maybe one in 20 don't continue. I did look at my data, and I had 20% of my patients not completing treatment at a year. So what are the barriers to compliance? This non-adherence to treatment can be non-intentional or intentional. And there are many reasons for why a patient might discontinue treatment, but for the fact is that we might not be able to control ourselves. In this Australian clinic study, again out of Mark's clinic, 42% of patients in his series uh, discontinued treatments. 15% of these discontinued because of clinical reasons, the remainder for other different challenges. So let's talk about non-adherence to treatment. In 30% of cases, it's unintentional. 70%, it is intentional. So unintentional causes might be, well, you're absent-minded, you forgot to take your medications, you missed an appointment, you've lost your diary. Intentional reasons to cease treatment are, as you can see there, much more varied, things that are much more difficult to control. So this is a patient that I'll present to you. Many of you would have similar, similar patients. It's a 92-year-old female. She's got uh, a new vessel at her left macula. And the angiogram shows that uh, she has a retinal angiomatous proliferation lesion with a lot of edema. At baseline, marked edema. But you'll see that the visit after baseline is at four months. And basically, this patient had one injection, thought everything was doing well, did not turn up until four months. And she's better, but she has still persisting activity. She's now treated uh, intensively on a monthly basis, becomes dry, and then at month 12 doesn't attend, and at month 18 she comes back with recurrent leak. And fortunately, commencing treatment, she was able to achieve a good result. Structured patient education is around us. Uh, we have the Macular Diseases Foundation. We have Vision Australia. Some of our optometric colleagues also provide low vision aids. Um, Bayer has a product, an excellent product called uh, SmartSight. But whatever patient education we use, 
it must have certain criteria. That is, it sets realistic expectations, it addresses issues like natural history, disease, pathophysiology and anatomy, so a patient really understands what, the, what is the disease they're actually suffering from. It's got to be relevant not only to the patient but also the carer and other healthcare professionals, and that also means optometrists as well, GPs. Uh, this is uh, SmartSight. Some of you will use this. Uh, Paul Mitchell spoke glowingly about this um, support program, and I do as well. It is a holistic approach to improving patient experience and maximising the quality use of the medication that we prescribe, and also to improve quality of life, not just visual acuity and letters on a EDTRS chart. Smart Sight complements standard care, and the word is <coughs> complements. It partners uh, with us. It reinforces the importance of adherence and persistence to therapy. It sets realistic treatment expectations. It encourages regular self-monitoring. But there are also other aspects to this program that we are not resourced to do in our clinics, and that is it deals with lifestyle aspects, diet, uh, social supports, but importantly, I've put in here the last point, for their carers. So many of the patients who enrol in this program come back to me and their carers, daughters or spouses will say, this has been really useful for me as well. So SmartSight fundamentally aims to collaborate. It has a multi-directional design and that is there are phone calls, there is printed literature and this um, really reinforces from multiple angles uh, what a patient uh, needs in order to embark on this treatment. Uh, this is data that has been uh, gathered and it shows that patients who are on a support program that is smart site are more likely to remain on treatment than those who are not. So the take home messages are these. Visual impairment has a significant impact on quality of life and that's something I think in my practice I don't think a lot about quality of life because patients don't really get to tell us what they can or cannot do. Anti-VEGF therapy is a marathon. It involves multiple injections, however, however you want to structure it, for a very long time. Patients are prone to non-adherence and, and therefore suboptimal outcome. And in the real world, I think this is the determinant of ultimate visual outcome, not perhaps the treatment frequency or maybe even the drug we use. Patient education and support programs can work collaboratively with us in the clinic, and this holistic approach improves patient experience, maximises the quality of what we're uh, administering to our patients and what society pays for.